Hello everybody um, and welcome to one of our Dorothy Kuya lectures uh, for Slavery Remembrance Day. My name is Laura Pye and I am the director here at National Museums Liverpool. And it's great to have you joining us uh, for this event. The Dorothy Kuya lectures are one of a series that we're doing this year for Slavery Remembrance Day, named after the late Dorothy Kuya, a activist from the Liverpool Aid community who worked tirelessly to help us develop uh, and, and uh, open the International Slavery Museum, as well as the work she did uh, in Liverpool and in other parts of the UK around race equality um, and driving race equality issues. Uh, we named the lecture series after her a number of years ago, um, and we're delighted to be able to grow that series and be able to do more of those talks uh, this year. Slavery Remembrance Day is something that we've commemorated here in Liverpool for over 20 years. It's an important pro part of the programme for the International Slavery Museum and it's something that we work hard to produce with our communities every year. This year, I'm delighted to introduce Maria O'Reilly as one of the speakers of the Dorothy Kuya Lecture Series. Maria has been a keen and active campaigner for race equality and social justice since the 1970s. She returned to further education as a young mother, qualifying as a social worker. She went on to achieve a master's degree at the University of Liverpool in social studies, race discrimination and politics. She has then filled numerous positions in the Commission for Race Equality in Merseyside Community Relations Council in the 70s and 80s before becoming the coordinator of the LA Law Centre. Maria co-founded Liverpool's Black Sisters Group alongside other community activists as a way of improving the lives of women in their communities. She was also a member of the Liverpool Aid Defence Committee, which was founded during the Toxteth uprisings to monitor police behaviour, provide support for those arrested uh, and assess the decisions of the judiciary. Maria worked tirelessly for a number of years supporting survivors of race discrimination, supporting asylum seekers and being involved in the foundation and support of a number of grassroots organisations fighting for race equality and social justice. She's joining us now to talk about some of her memories of her time here in Liverpool and to reflect on how things have changed over those years and how things still need to move forward. I'll hand you over to Maria. I've been invited to speak about remembrance um, and reminiscence. I'd like, first of all, to thank you for inviting me to, to do this. It's a um, really big honour. Uh, and I know that um, I've been asked to do it because there are lots of local people who are trying to engage with the, the museum um, at, the, at the minute. I'd first of all like to say about Dorothy Kuya, um, she was an activist uh, on a policy level, but she came from a family that were all activists. She has a sister called Norma, who did a lot of stuff on the ground in terms of the NHS, and a brother, um, rest in peace, as well, who was very active in the union. So I think that she came from a family, um, working class, that were out there trying to change things. I'd like to start off, because we are in the Slavery Museum, about the millions of Africans who were murdered, plus the billions of pounds that were stolen in artefacts, gold, diamonds and other commodities. And that's taken from Larka 1992 Race and Racism Exhibition. By the end of the 18th century, four-fifths of the slave trade was centred in Liverpool, and that's where I start to reminisce. I uh, was born in 1949. Prior to my being born, I have a lot of history to do with my father is a Liverpool-born black man, deceased. People think that everybody came on the Windrush. People didn't. We've been here a long, long time. I talk about my father in a way that his experience is one of a lot of elderly uh, black men. They were ignored in terms of employment, shunted into small areas um, to live, experienced a lot of racism, blatant racism and violence. Many of them uh, could not go into town. My father was absolutely savagely beaten when I was about 12. Uh, in the Shalott Street Wine Lodge when he'd gone out uh, with my mother to meet some friends. That was a horrible experience and not an experience just for him, an experience that lots of people experienced then. Lots of youngsters 
in my dad's era couldn't even go to the dole uh, which was in Lisey Street because if they did they would be followed by gangs of white youths they couldn't go out of the areas that where the black settlement was unless they went in gangs um, or groups should I say because then they could defend themselves they could not go alone unfortunately in Liverpool there are still some places that are like this and in the North City um, that is a place where you would not go years and years ago nor would you be able to go up into the South End Toxteth, the Dingle years ago Growing up in a multiracial community, um, I was born in Kent Gardens, which is Liverpool One. And the beauty of that was that there were people there who came from every part of the world. So I didn't know anything else until I was about 11, when we moved to a, a, an area, a Chilwell, which was an overspill. Lots of things that were going on, I knew about, I already knew about the 1919 race riots and the murder of Charles Wotton. I already knew about the, the deportation of the Chinese seamen because I came from Liverpool One, um, where those stories were told to us as young people. But I did not realise what racism was as a child until I moved out onto an overspill estate. It was a mainly white community and I remember saying to my mum, why is everybody white here? And I remember her saying to me, because that's just the way it is. I had personal racist experience and so did my family when we lived in Chilwell and the history of slavery goes right through. History is not something to, to romanticise, history is who we are and where we come from. I wouldn't be here if my grandfather hadn't come from Jamaica in 1898. Um, the things that were going on in the white community that I experienced in Chilwell were, were they believed that my father and myself and our family sat around the floor and let our dinners from a fire. Um, they believed all kinds of things that were said to us. We were called names, we were attacked. We weren't the only family to live in the street that I lived in. Four black families had moved up there at the same time and it was a blessing that they had because we were able as children to play together and to make friends with other children uh, in Chilwell and to try and overcome the, that racism with the support that we had. My mother went out many a time as a white woman and had to fight physically to defend us. I then went on to work when I was about 15 down at the dock um, in tower buildings down where I am now as a matter of fact. And my job was to um, give letters out to uh, the customs house in, in town. When I was coming down there, because I'd never really seen black people in a group, I saw a group of black people standing there and went over to see what it was about, because I'm dead and hosey anyway. And it was Angela Davis. They were picketing um, for Angela Davis. I joined that picket and lost my job. Um, when I didn't turn up for work in the afternoon time. Some people would say, well, yes, you should have done. But I went in and the boss said to me, um, why were you off? And it's the first line, last lie I ever told, because I said to him I had a headache, and he said, no, I saw you standing with those coloured people. And I said, I'm not coloured, I'm not a rainbow, um, I'm black. And he said, you take your cards, and away I went. I also remember in the 60s or late 50s when I was in Kent Gardens, my mother crying when um, Kennedy was assassinated, never knowing what that meant. Um, and she tried to explain that black people were going to have some kind of a future in America if Kennedy stayed alive. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. But it's something that stuck in my mind. Um, Anti-apartheid um, movement, um, I took part in those sorts of things as, as a youngster with my mother and father. We went on marches. Uh, my mother was um, an activist. My father um, was in the union. Um, my mother uh, led a rent strike um, in Chilwell as the uh, chair of um, a Liverpool rent strike um, committee and it was quite powerful. That was in 1968. So in some ways I think my activism um, 
I, I was just brought up with this. I then, um, as I got um, married, moved out um, into Kirby. Um, again, another reminiscence of, of how racist people can be. I moved into a ground floor um, masonette and not to go to finally over it, walking to the market, they set a dog on my son in the pram. Um, they painted inside of the masonette um, doorway um, the usual racist ends and whatever, and they put a dead bird outside the door with a knife in it. Um, so all those things, that's how bad racism can get when you go to an area as a pioneer, really, um, years and years ago. I often feel sorry now when I hear about refugees being put into other areas around the city where they are pioneers because they will meet and do meet uh, a lot of um, exclusion and racism. I engaged in Netherly in um, a housing campaign. We lived in the most horrible of, um, of flats. I don't know whether people ever remember them, but there was 1,500 flats um, in that area, nowhere for the children to play or whatever. And just to scare, scare quickly over it, um, I was um, black and leading that campaign along with another a load of um, women, very facey women in Netherly. And, the, and somebody sent out from the City Council someone to see me from the MCRC. Um, and I said, why have you come? And they said, oh, well, because um, you're black. And, and, and I said, but I'm here fighting alongside other women about housing. I don't want that stereotype, um, you know, being put on me when it's a wider housing campaign. One of the one of the wonderful things about Netherly was that there were sixty or seventy families, um, Liverpool-born black families, uh, white women married to to black men, and we experienced a lot of racism, not from where you would think we would get it. We were getting it from the National Front, obviously. But within the Labour movement, um, we experienced it in the, in the Netherly Labour Club when we went there to um, raise an issue of fascists drinking in the Labour part in the Labour Club, and who had attacked a black man. This black man was um, a scientist. It's something to do with his eyes. I can't really quite recall, but he'd been in a pub with an Irish woman, and a group of men had attacked him. He jumped over the bar to try and save himself and they just threw him back and he was battered and he was stabbed in the eye. That ruined his career. His name was Jackson Nkwangi. The judge said um, when we went to trial with him that outside of South Africa it was the worst attack he'd ever seen on a black man in, in Britain. The, the National Front and the, and the ANA and we were the anti-Nazi league, we'd formed and joined that, um, were active where we lived. We went on, well, as youngsters, we went on coaches up to Lewisham and Southall. Um, we, saw, we even went on the, um, the Deptford uh, 13 uh, marches and that. We witnessed what it's like to stand up to racism uh, in a group and to stand up to fascists in effect. Uh, and we were young. At home here in Liverpool, we had the Liverpool Black Organisation um, and we formed ourselves around a couple of campaigns. One of the worst ones was the Listener article where we were called the sons and daughters of prostitutes and black seamen and that is attributed to the police uh, constable having said this on the radio. We therefore campaigned against the radio and um, Many people marched on that march. What people don't remember about Liverpool or can't take on board is that we are part, we are Scousers, we're black Scousers. We have a history in many countries, but what we also have is black and white families. Lots of our cousins are white, lots of our extended families are white, and when people attack us, our white families don't like it either. So when you come to see some of the marches, um, years and years ago, you will see that there are lots and lots of white people on those marches with us, um, trying to make sure that we're kept safe. 
One of the other campaigns that we had, because there was lo lots of discrimination in Liverpool, nobody worked in the shops who were black. If you went in the shops, and still happens now anyway, you followed around as though you're a criminal, as though you're going to be a shoplifter. And we laugh because while they're following us around, somebody else is robbing them blind. In the, we went to, uh, there was a young man who went into the army and navy stores with his mum to buy, buy a coat and he was accused of stealing the coat. We immediately rallied ourselves and what we did was we had a meeting and decided how could we make the biggest impact. The biggest impact we thought was to change all our money into pennies and the bank was very helpful to us at the time. The bank used to be by Lewis's um, and the manager there was really up for what we were up to. Changed all our money into pennies and then we went into the shop and in a large big group and one by one we bought something, paid for it in pennies and then we got in another queue when we wanted to change it and get it back. And so we disrupted the whole of the shop. Um, the police arrived. The outcome of it was that the manager took on board what was being said, met with um, some of the Liverpool Black organisation, um, made some policy uh, issues and compensated the young man. I worked um, at the Merseyside Community Relations Council from about 1974, I think, or five, as a volunteer. I worked right the way through for 13 years with alongside lots of really committed people. Uh, the things that we had to deal with, um, Black Sisters started off in the, um, in the MCRC and that's an organisation now that's called Cumber Romani um, and does a lot of work. The reason that we had Black Sisters was that one of the white women's groups that was active at the time, um, somebody um, who'd been raped um, was asked by this group what colour was the rapist, as, though, as if it had anything to do. And when she said they were black, she said, what did they expect? We then formed as black sisters to go and challenge that sort of stereotyping of our black brothers. The Merseyside Anti-Racist Alliance was started by another activist, Rashid Mufti, uh, Gideon Ventoven, and lots of other people, uh, Larka. That did a lot of work. When you hear about kick racism out of football, well, that started with about eight of us um, through Merseyside uh, Anti-Racist Alliance, going standing up at Everton Football Ground and Liverpool Football Ground, getting spat on, giving out leaflets and painting out the stuff that was on the walls that was painted when they had black a black footballer. Um, so thinking back to how racism has evolved itself into Liverpool, you can see that the history um, is is not romantic. We didn't sail in on a lily pad. We, um, we're born here. Uh, the people are coming here all the time and people are experiencing through from, to my memory, right up to the 1980s, they're experiencing this racism. In the 1980s, we had what was called the uprisings. The uprisings came as a result of young black men and women standing up to white men in uniforms. And when you're, we'd had no access really to education. You couldn't even get into the university um, years ago. If you, there used to be a cut through um, into the university that took you into um, the South End. And when one time, one of the um, security guards informed us that somebody had put up a notice saying, be careful with your belongings, we have seen half-caste people coming through here. Um, and that was the level of um, racism that we were facing through education. So we'd had all of those things, no poor housing, education, definitely apartheid in town, um, no jobs, no, no access, no visible access outside of the live play community. Um, to black people and those black people who were pioneers and were moved out, many of them tried to get back into Liverpool 8 because they were being terrorised. 
We had the Federation of Black Organisations, which in opposition to uh, the militant's idea that excluded black socialists from the movement because they didn't prioritise the things that were happening to us and were important, which was race and discrimination. We stood our own black candidate, Delroy Burris, who's now deceased, another, another marvellous activist. We then went on as well, alongside this, to have the Consortium of Black Organisations, where we pulled together all the organisations as one voice, in, because what was happening was people were parachuting into the Liverpool Lake community, um, taking away the ideas um, from the organisations and not putting anything back. So in order to block that, um, we had the Consortium of Black Organisations where people had to come and speak to the whole of the organisation. One example of that um, is when the Slavery Museum um, was first muted. They tried to handpick people to go on a board and that was not the way that we had always operated in the black community. We were a team all together in, as a community and we did things together. We liked to be consulted. So what we did was we actually picketed um, that meeting about the, um, the Slavery Museum and put together a load of ideas as to why we thought it might benefit the black community and get the message across in a way that was anti-racist and anti-discriminatory. And as you can see, over the years, the, the Slavery Museum has evolved to being something near enough to what it is that we had asked for in the beginning. The Black Caucus formed in terms of the, the militant and the local authority. It formed at the time when it was a Liberal um, Council and it was there to put forward policy issues and documents to change things. Unfortunately, they were never really acted upon and many of the things that are going on now would have been sorted out had the Black Caucus been taken seriously and the policy documents that they produced had been acted upon. In response to the uprisings, we had to have a Liverpool Aid Defence Committee. Um, that was because people were being arrested at random in the streets, even people who were just out on the street coming home from wherever they'd been. Um, they were being arrested. Young people were being beaten and they were being taken to hospitals. They were being taken to Risley. They were going through the courts and the magistrates' courts were always known as police courts and the magistrates just believed whatever the police said and the solicitors could, well, many of the solicitors just went along with it. It was like a club and people were just taken uh, on remand. So what we had to do was we had to organise in a way that we were able to identify, we had to have court spotters finding out where people were being taken if they were arrested. We had to have people, to t uh, volunteers in cars to take mothers up to see their children. Um, I think we had to have access to those who were shot. And one of the things in the, in the uprisings, which people don't know, right, we were protesting against pre police brutality. We were protesting against A Division coming into C Division. We were C, C Division. A Division was the North End. A Division would come in to C Division, beat up, racially abuse and go away unmarked vans, because the vans are not like what they are now, um, unmarked vans, get away, when we challenge it, people would say, well, you know, no, none of our officers were in that area. And that. During these uprisings, on the first time on the British net mainland, we were shot with CS gas canisters. This shot, this shooting down, in many cases, was deliberate and many people got very serious injuries. 13 people in our records were shot. No one has ever, ever taken up why this, uh, these canisters were used as weapons against children, because most of the, the kids on the street fighting were children. And this is still an ongoing um, thing for us. The, Deputy Chief Constable at the time was Mr Wright, who also has something to do with the Hillsborough um, 
tragedies as well. So there is a pattern right the way through. We were involved as well with the Trade Union Centre um, in, in Liverpool, which was a, an idea about the community, the reproduction area and the production area coming together. And that, that, that was the seeds of a, of a proper organised movement. And that. Um, during the 80s, there was many important uh, works were written. The Area Profile Group, they did lots of works on um, discrimination in housing, discrimination for the elderly in social services, dif discrimination in education, discrimination in politics, the, a whole load of booklets. And once again, nobody took them seriously and nobody really picked up. And so we still have those continuing um, issues now in 2021. Going through to, going through to the 90s, we, we formed lots of organisations as a group. Um, I'm only speaking here and I want to make it clear on behalf of all the activists that have gone before me and are still there and some of the new ones are, are coming up. Right, we had we formed groups like Survivors for um, of Racial Discrimination, and they were groups of people mainly who worked within the local authority at the time in the nineties, um, who had come through Merseyside um, skill training, which was an initiative set up in the eighties, and a, to to break down the barriers and to get some black workers into uh, the local authority. What happened while they were there was obviously that they were going to experience discrimination and they did. There was the Black Workers Group that was set up with inside of the local authority at the time and survivors of racial discrimination saw a group of people got together and represented each other in tribunals um, to try and <coughs> legally uh, break the discrimination that was going on with inside of the local authority. In terms of access to law, that the Law Centre went out and uh, did in partnership with a community college because we had Wally Brown there as a senior at the time and we had someone to talk to to set this up. We did that because during the 80s and well before then, it's very obvious that the courts, the police, the judiciary in general, the solicitors, all were white. And therefore, you could not, even as a jury, get um, justice from your peers as it's supposed to be. So we set up access to law in the law centre in order to train young people in all aspects of law and to move them on through the universities or as barristers. That's been very successful in a way because you now see a lot more um, diversity inside of the courts. Not enough, and maybe, maybe there needs to be more. But we, through access to law, we got our own black barristers and we got our own black solicitor, uh, George White, who won an award in London um, for um, his legal work. We worked a lot at the time with allies. Elkin Abrahamson, who's a, a wonderful person, who did uh, all the work with Hillsborough along with other people. He worked very hard with the Law Centre um, in setting up the, these things. We then realised that we were having an influx at the time of refugees in the 90s, mainly Kosovan refugees at the time, who were coming in and were being put into Catherine, Catherine House on Parliament Street. They didn't have anything really. And what we did was we went out and we um, asked the lads on Granby Street and wherever to clothe them so they didn't look ridiculous in the clothes that they had on. And people rallied and people came forward and gave that clothes. And that, that's the kindness of a, of a community that I come from. We then had to go and lobby to try and get set up a Merseyside Immigration Advice Unit because we were getting lots of people. We had Congo refugees um, coming in from the Congo at the time. There was a lot of, we had some background to this because in the, I think in the, in the 70s um, the, the, and into just the beginning of the 80s, we had the Chilean refugees. So we'd been doing a lot of work. We finally set up the Merseyside Immigration Advice Unit and unfortunately, through lack of insight, the council withdrew its funding in 2000 and it, it, it vanished. Um, we had support asylum seekers. 
We had various campaigns. We are, obviously, we had the Stephen Lawrence murder at the time, and I was lucky enough to, uh, to chair a meeting with Doreen Lawrence in Blackburn House, and what a wonderful woman she is to have carried on fighting for her son. I think, finally, um, I've been doing a lot of reminiscing um, and whatever, and it takes us up in, um, into Black Lives Matter. Obviously, other mothers, along with Stephen Lawrence, have lost children. Anthony Walker Foundation, um, the murder of him in Heighton, you know, some of the children, um, you know, Mase, who was found dead in Liverpool One in the shopping centre, Sonko, who was shot um, on Lodge Lane. These are all mothers with broken hearts, and that, and, you know, what can I say? Um, we've now got Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, the most horrible, wicked watching of an officer murder a man in front of our eyes, I think, inf inflamed everybody. Um, racism hasn't gone away, it's just getting filmed more now. Um, and maybe that's a good thing that people think now what we've been saying over the years is, is, you know, is true. We've got new voices out there. We've still got the same struggles. I think we've got the same struggles in Liverpool because had people listened in the 70s and 80s and 90s and fostered those initiatives and reports and the effort that was being put in by um, Liverpool born black in the main academics and that would come through, then we wouldn't have the same struggles. We'd probably have moved on quite a lot further than we are. I always think of Liverpool like a chocolate box with a lovely cover and it all looks marvellous and the world in one city and all of these things. And yet when you open it up, some of the chocolates in there are rotten because they're not real. They're not, um, they're still, if you go into the town centre, you can hardly see anybody uh, black. Um, if you go into big organisations, you can see, hardly see anybody at the top. And, and this is considering that in the black community, lots of our children have been encouraged through the opening up of education to go through to universities and places like that and are coming out with, deg with degrees. I think the impact of Brexit um, has been very negative. I've been collecting along with a friend of mine since Brexit, uh, since the start of Brexit three, three or four years ago, cuttings from, the, from newspapers. I've now got absolutely hundreds of cuttings from the Liverpool Echo and from the Metro of racial abuse and attacks that have been, have gone on in the last three years um, since Brexit. So people are emboldened, the type of people we were fighting, um, the Nazis I call them, and we were fighting um, in the 80s and the 70s, tried to walk on our streets a couple of years ago and are emboldened by the Brexit and the rhetoric that comes out from um, Patel and the rest of the and the rest of the government, which is anti the other, um, and fear of strangers, and and as I keep saying, and you can see from the attacks on the gay community in 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 Bell Street, these people are not just against us; they're against everyone, and they're even against themselves when it comes down to it. These are people who are evil, and should be remembered. My father fought in the war. Um, in the Second World War on the Arctic convoys, as did a lot of black seamen, um, dangerous, whatever, and they went out there to fight these kind of people. I think we should always remember that every time they rear their head and try and walk on Liverpool streets. Um, I think one of Liverpool's um, legacies from slavery is this attitude that, um, and I'm not undermining it at all. There are countries all over the world that will need charity and need stuff from us. But this attitude towards us as, um, how can I put it, pennies for the black babies, um, instead of moving on psychologically to see us as black scousers and the people who are coming in, 
um, as refugees and wherever, as highly intelligent, highly qualified people whose skills we could use. Um, I think I think it's a, it's such a loss uh, to us. I think that um, the practicing of apartheid in Liverpool, no matter which way that you look at it, if you exclude somebody, if you don't involve them, if you leave out black citizens um, from the economic development of this of this city, then you are practicing apartheid, and there's no getting away from it. The other thing is the lack of economic benefit to black communities from organisations that have been built and st on stolen African wealth. We were capital. We were not human beings. We, we were used as capital. We were taken, enslaved, along with gold, silver, millions of pounds, billions of pounds worth of stuff. And yet none of that wealth has been ploughed back in to um, the black community. One of the other things that in terms of being the, the slavery museum, they have a shop there. And in that shop, I don't think that they sell anything that is created um, in, by Liverpool black people or communities. And I think that would be one way of showing and moving forward on Black Lives Matters to doing something positive so that some of that wealth would go back into the community um, and make donations to the organisations that are out there on the ground struggling. Um, all black, or, all organisations, voluntary organisations, black or white struggle for money. But you imagine if somebody doesn't believe in your cause and somebody won't fund, you're standing up for yourself and standing against discrimination. It's very hard then for us to raise the funding that we need. So there needs to be a marrying up of economic development and people thinking very clearly of how they use their organisations to empower and to put in some economic in infrastructure into the, into the black community. Uh, when I say black, I mean everybody who comes from the African dysphoria, um, from the majority people in this world, because as a matter of fact, we are the majority in this world and we have been abused, enslaved and used by the minority. Um, and I hope that the youngsters who come after us um, build on um, alliances, make progress, use their brains, use their intelligence and keep their activism up.